Well, hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you could join. I could join you today this way rather than in person. It's just, as you can imagine, it's busy at the State House these days. So I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint. It's going to, well, maybe not. It'll take me just a second. Um, I, oh, is it possible for me to share my screen? Um, it looks it looks like um, Peter Walsh is sharing his screen. Would it be possible for me to be able to share my screen? Okay. I mean, I can go. I can go ahead, but but it might be easier. Peter, do you know how to take it off the sharing? Um, so I might as well go ahead. I, it, I just, it's got to be a little weird. Uh, I'm now the host, so I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen, period. Okay, here we go. All right. Well, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the householder trial so that you, so that you know about that. Um, my guess is you followed it super closely like I did. Um, this was the largest public corruption, you know, trial in our history. Um, we're talking about more than sixty million dollars, um, and and obvious serious consequences for both, you know, voters' trust and also for our pocketbooks. And so, one of the things that I think is important is, yes, you know, um, Householder was found guilty. Matt Borges was found guilty, but, and it's so important that they are held accountable. But we also need to think about the ways that this could happen again unless we actually make some changes. And so I'm going to encourage you, you know, if you have questions, throw them into the chat. During this conversation, um, my friend Tiffany, um, who works with me at Common Cause, is going to throw kind of some links into the chat as well so that you can actually see that. We can share those afterwards. I'm also very willing to share the slides as well so that you have that. Um, and, and so, you know, any questions you have, throw there, throw in there. If you are like, wait a second, she never got to my question. You'll see my email right there at cturser at commoncause.org. And uh, thank you all so much and welcome. To, and we're gonna take a step back in time. Okay, so in July, 20. 20. So we were deep in the midst of the beginning of the pandemic. Most of us were being hermits. Um, Larry Householder was arrested. And it both felt like completely out of the, you know, out of the blue. And it also seemed like, well, of course he should be arrested. You could tell. I mean, there was so much kind of shenanigans going on with House Bill 6. All, all, you know, you, you'll remember in 2019, the weird mailers, the TV ads, certainly the um, attack, to, you know, to try to stop the referendum where they suggested the Chinese government was coming after our information. So this is a diagram to give you a picture of the information that we had you know, in July of 2020. So the arrest was July 21st, 2020. And at the time, this was the kind of information that we had. So we we understood that there was essentially $60 million that we were talking about, you know, not exactly, but $60 million that we were talking about. We understood that there was this complicated interlocking use of dark money, nonprofits, to advance public policy and also to advance Larry Householder's career. So, you know, to get his folks elected so that they would then vote for him to be Speaker of the House. And as you might imagine, you know, this is, it's a fairly complicated interlocking thing. And, you know, at the time, you know, it, it just seemed like, well, wait a second, does it actually take the FBI doing an investigation to actually understand how these nonprofits that are created for the public good were used to advance, you know, advance his career and were used in a really corrupt way. 
Now, Tiffany threw in a timeline for folks who want to take a deep dive and want to think about, well, what exactly happened with the House Bill 6 legislation? When do we learn information? Um, and I'd encourage you to, you know, kind of check that out, get a sense of where this is going. Now, you'll notice I made a few changes here, you know, at the end. So we have, you know, kind of information about the criminal complaint. We have a sense of like, okay, it was a web of all sorts of different nonprofits and shenanigans to try to hide their activity. And we know that this is possible because of a decision called Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission that allowed corporations to get actively involved in elections by paying for political ads. And, you know, corporations include nonprofit corporations, all sorts of nonprofit corporations started popping up as a way to hide activities or not make it clear who was funding political ads. And those political ads had silly names like Generation Now. Right now, if you Google Generation Now, you'll come up with a record company. You know, just these innocuous names, they were used for a short period of time and then folks move on. So now we're at the point that folks have pled guilty, folks have been found guilty, and, and sadly, um, Neil Clark um, died as a result of suicide. Um, and so even though many of us were able to read about his words during the trial, um, he did not actually come to trial or plead guilty. So I, I always think it's helpful, you know, when we start to talk about, okay, all this, all the shady money to have a sense of who the players are. So first of all, you know, we have Larry Householder, who, uh, former Speaker of the House. So he was a Speaker of the House during the early aughts. He left for a period of time. And at, during the time that he was there in the early aughts, there was a lot of suggestion that he was really strong arming people over campaign contributions. There was a thing called the Householder Memo that laid out how he attempted to wrangle money and use it to cement his influence. And he was not, you know, he was investigated by the FBI at that point, but certainly was not arrested. But it was the kind of thing where you're like, okay, this guy is somebody to watch pretty closely when it comes to money and politics. He then, of course, manages to use, uh, you know, first energy money through Generation Now, which is the nonprofit that was created and that Larry Householder has been found guilty of actually being responsible for. There was plenty of evidence that was released during the trial highlighting all the different kind of machinations um, to get not just him elected, but his friends elected so that he could become Speaker of the Ohio House again. Now, I included this quote from Bill Seitz because, you know, he's from your neck of the woods. Um, you know, it's, it's that thing where, you know, this is a guy, um, charming, um, very creative when it comes to politics. And unfortunately, you know, he used that creativity you know how you, we always say, use your creativity for good, not evil. He, he was definitely using his creativity in a way that was not useful. And then, in fact, when we think about, you know, $60 million, this was the first time in U.S. history, so in our history, where dark money groups were used essentially to hide bribery. Now, six, it's not like $60 million ended up in his pocket. It ended up being used to um, help him get elected, help his friends get elected, to move House Bill 6, which was legislation to bail out two nuclear plants. Now, you might say, well, wait a second, $60 million, that is a lot of money. And it is a lot of money until you realize that they anticipated getting approximately $1.3 billion dollars from rate payers all over Ohio. So anybody who was paying an electric bill over a period of time, would have been seven years, um, that, that in fact, we would have ended up paying a little bit of all of us um, 1.3, possibly $1.5 billion. And so this scheme involved First Energy, of course. First Energy um, in 2021 signed a deferred prosecution agreement and they were fined. 
They've also been fined by the Security and Exchange Commission and FERC, which is basically it's the Federal Energy you know, Regulation Commission, um, for not reporting their lobbying activities. So that's the other thing that, that like, so there were some parameters, some disclosure that was required that First Energy intentionally avoided. Now, you will notice here that not one of the people who's, you know, from this cast of characters, cast of characters was actually a person who worked for First Energy. So we know that the corporation said they did the bribery. One of the remaining questions is, well, who did the bribe? Well, you know, you know, we can make some guesses. You know, Chuck Jones, who was in fact in charge at that point, seems the logical person. Um, but it may be that there will be additional, you know, charges. Um, there are other activities that First Energy engaged in that it may lead to other additional charges. But this is the beginning. And so what we know from from the trial is that in fact money was used to move move the move the legislation along. Now, I included this slide, uh, and I think this is important because when we went, you know, when we were in 2019, you know, those of us who pay, pay a lot of attention to politics were like, oh, this is super dirty. There's something really wrong here. And we, you know, we had reporters that were working really hard to actually put together, you know, as much information as they could. But in July 2020, this is, a, this is a graphic that was, was created based on research from Kathy Ann Kowalski. She does I on, on Ohio. She's a kind of an energy, an energy expert as well as an energy and campaign finance expert. This is what she was able to track prior to, you know, the arrests. And so, you know, we essentially prior to the arrests, based on information that she had, based on information she got from kind of other reporters, based on kind of the media reports that were out there, there wasn't a ton of information. So she spent, you know, time saying, okay, well, who's connected to, to who? And what did I know before the actual arrest? And I think this makes it extremely clear how we don't have the ability to follow the money. And because we don't have the ability to follow the money, we end up missing things. And, you know, obviously there's serious consequences for folks who own, you know, the stock. For example, if you were somebody who owned some section of First Energy money, you might not actually know what they were act up to. And that lack of accountability is really problematic. Then there is the lack of accountability for voters and the lack of accountability for folks that you know, the public has a right to know what's actually going on in their elections. It is a public good. It's a way to address corruption. So here we can just get a sense of like, well, wait a second, we were really missing a lot of this information. Now, I think, you know, this, you know, I think it's really important that, uh, you know, uh, that these arrests occurred. It's important that we had these trials. I'm super jealous of all of you living in Cincinnati because I, I wanted to go every single day. And of course, it was just a little too far to do that. And I think it's important to realize that the arrests happened in 2020, but we had, you know, two major election cycles, you know, obviously including the local races, but, you know, but we had, this had meaningful consequences for who is now actually in the state legislature. <clears throat> and so it's important to think, when we think about disclosure, we also need to think about, well, we need meaningful, timely disclosure as well. Now, sometimes when people talk about, you know, uh, Citizens United, the biggest thing that we hit is corporations essentially were given First Amendment rights. All right, this was a, you know, we're talking about 2010. It was an incredibly odd decision. Like, I don't think anyone besides the 
U.S. Supreme Court majority was thinking, you know, what's really sad. You know, what doesn't really work. We just don't have good disclosure from, you know, we don't we don't have, you know, um, good transparency and um, we don't have um, we don't have a uh, corporations. We just don't know what they want from us. It's just so sad. We need to give them First Amendment rights. None of us would, you know, none of us would be thinking, thinking about that. But what happened is that in the Citizens United decision, um, the court essentially said, these advertisements are not coordinated with the candidates. And since they're not coordinated with the candidates, they're independent. They're separate from the candidates. So the corporations could spend money and there's no reason for them not to be able to do that because how are they going to influence the candidates? They're separate. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're not coordinated. Now, any of us who pay, I don't know, pay any attention would say, well, that's an incredibly na- naive way to think about this, right? To think that a ton of money, millions of dollars could be spent by a corporation and that candidates would not know what was going on, would not be influenced by it, that there wouldn't be some surreptitious ways that information was exchanged. Um, I mean, it's incredibly naive, right? But what is important here is when, when the court and it was Anthony Kennedy writing for the majority. When the court made a decision, which is problematic, many of us, you know, are interested in amending the Constitution about to say that, you know, corporations don't have uh, First Amendment rights, that we're in, individuals do, humans do. Um, that's one piece. But one of the things that came out of the decision was that disclosure was a, a public good. And that, in fact, it's constitutional. So we shouldn't we shouldn't look at like what happened and think, oh, oh no, this is a system, and there's nothing we can do about it because of that Citizens United. It's just the way it is. No, that is not true. That is not just the way it is. Disclosure is a public good to root out quid pro quo. Obviously, being able to follow the money is a basic tenant of our campaign finance system. The problem is you know, that our state legislators, and for that matter, our members of Congress, presidential candidates, there's a benefit for them when it comes to dark money. At this point, they've had more than a decade to, to, you know, have this, what we can think of as a political tool. But this case, this Larry Householder trial, the Matt Borges trial, really highlights the consequences of not being able to follow the money. Now, here are some basic consequences. You know, think about this. At the end of the day, $1.3, $1.5 billion that they could have gotten. The other thing to think about, you know, this is kind of the scandal by by the numbers. And I always think that's an important way to think about it. A $230 million fine seems, it just seems enormous, right? Like it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Until you realize that, you know, First Energy may have just considered this the cost of doing business. This might have hurt them enough to behave a little better, but it's not an enormous, it's not an enormous fine. And certainly $3.9 million to address what they did related to lobbying. I mean, that's, that's, that's just, it's just not enough money for it to actually be meaningful. Now, the other thing that's important is, you know, we've been talking about householder, we've been talking about Borges, um, but but First Energy also gave $4.3 million to an entity that Sam Randazzo ran. So the money, yes, it didn't go exactly directly to Sam Randazzo, much like all of the household, householder, House Bill 6 scandal, it's all, hey, it got there indirectly. So the money, $4.3 million, was indirectly given to Sam Randazzo by First Energy. They admitted to it in the deferred prosecution agreement. Sam Randazzo then became, you know, the chair of the Public Utilities Commission, you know, the folks that regulate electricity, that that um, would have paid a lot of attention and uh, to House Bill 6. And in fact, 
he was very active and wrote the first version of House Bill 6, which we learned during the trial. So, you know, yes, we have all of the information about kind of what happened during the trial, but we should also be thinking about, well, what kind of disclosure do we need, not just in our elections, not just in our lobbying, but also what kind of disclosure do we need so that we actually have decent regulators? All right. So many of you might be like, well, wow, that House Bill 6, super duper corrupt. I'm sure the state legislature immediately took it off the books. One, they didn't immediately take it off the books. Yes, most of House Bill 6 is no longer on the books. But the part that was not about first energy, the part that was really because American Electric Power used their influence, was, it was basically a subsidy for two coal plants. One's in Ohio, one is actually in Indiana, and we are still paying. You know, we end up paying, you know, uh, so they're different estimates. If you go and you look on the Ohio Consumer Council's website, you can actually get a sense of like, well, what, you know, what are we talking about? But generally it's understood to be around $80,000 a day on our electric bills that we pay so that we can subsidize these aging coal plants one that's not even in Ohio. Now, what has happened at the state house? Well, literally nothing has happened at the state house to create better transparency. One of the things that made me crazy yesterday is that uh, that uh, Representative Brian Stewart in a House committee said that, in fact, he wanted to change the Ohio Constitution because Larry Householder was going to use dark money to extend the term limits that he wanted to do a citizen initiative using first energy's money obviously laundered so that it wouldn't be clear it was first energy money to extend term limits so he could extend his political career okay super dirty right but as opposed to thinking hey um what we what really needs to happen is we need greater transparency so this kind of activity it you know it's not possible you can follow the money that that if somebody wanted to put something before voters there, we would have good information about that kind of from day one. Well, no, as opposed to being worried about dark money, what Brian Stewart was saying is, oh no, we need to change the constitution to make it harder to actually do citizen initiatives. So I was super annoyed about that yesterday and we all should be, how's that? Now, um, one of the things that sometimes people were a little bit surprised about with the householder, trial was okay you know we we have these pictures from like law and order where where you know they've been found guilty and then you know the the constabulary comes up and they take them away to go off to prison right well in fe in the federal system the way that it works is yes um depending on you know what whether they were incarcerated during the time of their trial, they would immediately go back. But if they were out on bond, they stay out on bond for a pre-trial period, which is generally about 90 days. It can actually be longer. Um, during that time, um, there are what are called pre-trial officers. They're a little like probation officers or parole officers, where what they do is they do an investigation, they check out the home, they, they look at all the different circumstances, and then they provide a recommendation to the judge um, obviously, the prosecutors also provide a recommendation to the judge um, and and the defense will say, hey, um, you know, this is unreasonable, whatever it is. Uh, but 20 years is the maximum number of years. So now that he's been found guilty, he could get 20 years. Um, we will know more and we'll have a sense of what that what the consequences actually are, you know. Imagine, you know, we're talking about three more months is a reasonable amount of time to, to expect. Now we have, uh, you know, the deferred prosecution agreement. I realize I mentioned this earlier, but I do think, you know, one of the things that's important here is there's the briber and there's the person who was bribed. And, and so, you know, I, I'd mentioned earlier that it's very important to realize that 
First Energy in their deferred prosecution agreement essentially said, hey, we were doing this for our own benefit and we were bribing public officials. And so one public official would be Larry Householder, the other would be Sam Randazzo. And so as we think about this, we're still missing the human component of who did what. And so we should all kind of keep our eyes and don't be surprised if they're kind of additional additional arrests or additional activities. Um, one of the things that is super interesting to me is like Sam Randazzo is somebody who um, his house was raided by the FBI, but his house was raided in the FBI by the FBI, you know, more than two years ago. So I don't know what the holdup is. And it could be that there's some agreement that we don't yet know about. Um, but we should all be thinking about, well, yes, we need to do something about dark money in elections, but we should also be doing what we can so that we have greater transparency in the appointment process so that, you know, when a governor is selecting someone, there's not a way to hide, you know, a, basically the type of bribery that happened during this situation. Now, there are also other kinds of money and politics things that are out there so that, so that when we think about kind of dark money in the system, um, it's worth thinking about, you know, what, what happened with the governor? And, and clearly, you know, there was money that went to the governor's association. So there's the Republican Governors and Association. And generally what happens is that um, a governor will raise, you know, essentially raise the money. It goes to the association that comes to, to that, you know, once, so when they're up for election, it will come back to them. Um, and so, you know, you can look at this and think about, well, what about, you know, the campaign and the inauguration front fund? The other thing I think is important is I talked a little bit about like the, co the coordination between householder, first energy, generation now. It is against the law to coordinate that directly with a nonprofit. Um, you know, that is against the law. However, there are some pretty darn big loopholes in our coordination rules. And one of the things that I look at and I'm like, oh, that's really a problem is you might not be able to ask for yourself, but you can ask for your kid. And one of the things that really struck me, you know, when this came out in the Cincinnati Inquirer, and many, many of you may actually remember this, this would have been almost Christmas time. Um, uh, it, it was, you know, 22nd or 23rd in there somewhere, like close enough that I was like, it, it could be that people are going to miss this. But one of the things that really struck me is that Governor DeWine's press guy essentially said, oh, he's made this type of ask many times to numerous groups. And you're like, okay. You know, one of the things that, that we need to be thinking about is strengthening the anti-coordination rules so that this kind of activity cannot occur. Um, also, it's interesting to think about, okay, well, was, you know, was he talking about his son's campaign? What, was he talking about, you know, other, you know, other Republicans campaigns? Was he, was, was he talking about in any way his campaign? Now it's against the law, but there's something about like this type of ask to, for numerous groups that is problematic. So we do need to do something about an the anti-coordination language. We just need to toughen that up. All right, so this is a graphic that I think is, is a little bit helpful to think about like all the different ways that we could create greater transparency. And so, so clearly, you know, one of the obvious ones is to say, okay, if we need to shine a light on dark money, clearly if there are political advertisements, whether they're to promote legislation, so like lobbying the public or whether they're to support a candidate, we should be able to follow the money and understand who's paying for them. Now, in some states, California, Oregon would be good examples. Um, you know, when when you see an ad that says Generation Now, 
the top few donors are identified. There's a requirement that you can actually see that. So, so that imagine if folks had seen the generation now ads and it said, you know, hey, top donor is, you know, in fact, first energy, and they're the ones that want the bailout. Well, I'm sorry, you're asking for a bailout because you're broke. You, uh, your subsidiary is literally in bankruptcy and you have enough money to do this. It, it, it would just have been a really different experience during 2019. Now, the other thing that we can think about is disclosure of, you know, information that's at the state house. So in the late 90s, there were some changes to the Legislative Service Commission. So the best way to think about this, these are the folks who help write bills. They do research on bills. They essentially, you know, any amendments, they will write them for legislators that work with legislators so that they're, they're clear. You know, many of them are lawyers. Um, so these are, the, these are the folks that help legislators craft legislation. And it used to be that their records were public records. Any of us could actually see more closely, understand better what was happening because we could easily get access to the Legislative Service Commission records. Well, we can't anymore. They have deemed them off limits. So what we could do is create what, I, you know, we've been calling the Jim Siegel Disclosure Bill. This would be a market improvement. You know, if we say to ourselves, hey, we have a problem downstream, look upstream. Let's see, you know, the, we, if we had had good information about who was responsible for House Bill 6, it might have been easier to stop things before things completely spin, spun out of control. Now, I will tell you that one of the things that Jeff Longstreth testified about was essentially carrying paper copies and versions of House Bill 6 back and forth in a briefcase, you know, so paper copies in a briefcase, back and forth from, you know, legislators over to First Energy Solutions, the, the entity that was getting a bailout is now called Energy Harbor, um, and essentially, you know, giving to John Kiani, who was, was in, in the president, um, these bills, and they were doing that just in case you know, folks would, you know, as a way to avoid disclosure. So there were some things they were doing where um, they were avoiding public records intentionally, but we should do what we can to create as open a system as possible. And yes, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be things that, are go that folks who want to do bad things are going to do. Much, you know, much like, you know, you set up a speed limit, there are people that are going to go, you know, 75, some 80, and then they're going to be people that go 120. Well, we obviously want to do what we can to keep, you know, folks as close as possible to, you know, what's necessary. And, and I think when we think about disclosure, it's a way of providing guardrails. Doesn't mean that there aren't going to be bad actors, but we should have things in place so that we get information before things completely spin out of control. And so I think we should be thinking about creating greater transparency. You know, when you think about ethical filings and so think about Public Utilities Commission um, and also, we, you know, thinking about, you know, how, how can I put this? Thinking about basic lobbyist disclosure and how that information is a piece of the puzzle that'll help us root out corruption and, and hopefully lead to greater accountability. You know, at the end of the day, we worry about corruption because it means that we don't have representatives that are actually accountable to us. They're not legislating for us. And so then I'm going to take us to yesterday. So, so yesterday there was a hearing on House jo Joint Resolution 1. House Joint Resolution 1 would actually make it more challenging to change the Ohio Constitution. So, so many of us know that, um, you know, we have the ability to do citizen-led ballot measures. If we collect enough signatures, um, it's basically 10% of the gubernatorial votes, the last gubernatorial votes, about a little over 400,000 um, signatures would be required to do this, that 
that um, it's put on the ballot and um, we have to get 5% of the gubernatorial vote in 44 of the 88 counties. And, um, it, you know, if we get enough signatures, it's put on the ballot. But what happened is that uh, Brian Stewart, um, so he, this is a Pickaway County for folks who are like, where is that? It is fairly close to Columbus. It's a central Ohio area. Uh, he has a proposal that would make it much harder to pass a constitutional amendment by essentially creating 60% passage rate, meaning giving, making it harder by simply saying, okay, we don't, you know, we don't want to have a majority vote on this. We don't want to have kind of one person, you know, one person, one vote. We, we are, we're going to make it a 60% passage. Now, there, there are things that pass with more than 60%, of course, but it, it makes it just much more challenging. And then in the real kicker, um, this, this amendment also includes provisions that change things. So as opposed to, uh, as opposed to requiring 5% of the gubernatorial in 44 of the 88 counties, it requires them in all 88 counties. And you might say to yourself, well, okay. I mean, all right, you'll think about a smaller, less populous county. All right, well, that shouldn't be that hard, except for anyone who's done citizen initiatives. And I've been active in many of them and certainly active in many of them. And certainly um, I was a chair of, uh, you know, a couple of them. And oh my goodness, it's so hard to actually get to the, you know, to get to the 44 out of 88, yeah, you can do that. 88 out of 88, it's nearly insurmountable. And then the other thing in, you know, right now, um, if you if you file and you don't have enough signatures, you're given 10 additional days to, to make up the difference. And the reason is, of course, you don't actually no go in knowing exactly how many valid signatures you have. Yes, you can try to track them and figure out what's in the database and you, you can do your level best, um, but you, you might not have enough signatures. And let's face it, having some additional days is incredibly important. The ability to collect some additional signatures because you don't know what the Board of Elections might challenge. You don't know. Some counties are tougher than others. Uh, not having that additional you know, with the safe harbor days just to, to collect a few more is also really problematic. And on that note, let's see, I've, I've hit, uh, you know, I've hit what's going on right now at the state house. I think the thing that's really challenging is that um, yesterday a bill was introduced that would literally create a special election in August, and it would fund a special election, uh, it's approximately $20 million to do a special election so that they could put this measure on the August ballot. If it were to pass in the August ballot, that means that those folks that are collecting signatures right now for reproductive rights would have to, if it passed, would actually have to, to get to that 60% threshold. They wouldn't have the additional days. They would have the harder standards. And it it's, you know, mm. it's incredibly galling. It's incredibly galling simply because, you know, in December, uh, the state legislature got rid of the August special primary. And they said, oh, we're not doing the August special primary anymore. It's expensive. Um, it, it's, it, it's expensive and, you know, the voter turnout is terrible. It's almost always less than 10%. We're just going to get rid of it. So they, they're <laughs> anyway, but essentially what they would say is, oh, well, other people, you know, if you wanted to put a bond issue on or whatever, no, you can't do that, but we're the state legislature. If we want to actually dilute voter power and put this on the August ballot, we can. Now, this is not a done deal. This is legislation that was introduced yesterday. This is the problem. Senate President Matt Huffman has said that in fact, he is planning, you know, this is his plan is to put it on the August 
um, you know, special election. Uh, the thing to know about Matt Huffman, this, one of the things that he said uh, when asked about, you know, what, you know, how he felt about kind of political power and like what he thought he could get accomplished. And he said, well, if I want something, I can pretty much do what I want. And he's not wrong. What's really, you know, it will take a concerted, concerted effort to actually defeat this resolution. And, you know, so when we're thinking about kind of moving the ball forward, creating greater transparency, addressing redistricting, uh, all of the different ways that we could improve government, we're also going to have to be thinking about how can we play defense. Um, so, you know, I did want to encourage, you know, folks to take action. Tiffany will throw some information into the chat so they have it. Um, one of the things that we do know about the dark dark money and about what's happening at the state house is that yes, your emails are always important. So if you want to email, go for it. There's also um, email information in this, the lookup, but I would really encourage you all, you know, to make a phone call, um, you know, and, and because there is one bill that it's a democratic bill rather than a bipartisan or Republican bill. So it's unlikely to move. It's unlikely to have a hearing until you know, lame duck of next year, unless there's pressure. And so just let, and, and you know, at the end of the day, what's likely to pass is a, a bill that comes from Republicans or is bipartisan. So, you know, make some noise, make a phone call. You don't, you know, yes, a lot of times you can say, oh, I'm opposed to HJ one, that's super direct, but letting them know that you watch that householder trial, you are glad there's accountability, but that's not enough. You don't wanna get ripped off again. You wanna increase accountability. You need greater transparency at the state house and in Ohio elections. And there are lots of different ways to talk about this and to think about it. And you know, I would encourage you just to make that phone call when, when you have a chance, it doesn't have to be today, it can be tomorrow. Um, and don't feel bad about leaving a voicemail. You know, the idea is just let them know that there are people that are paying attention to what they're doing. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And my guess is you might actually have a few questions. You know, one, one question I have, Catherine, is how do we get citizens really fired up and angry about all these things that are happening in Columbus. The, the, the refusal to the two constitutional amendments on redistricting that were passed in 2015 and 2018 have been ignored by the legislature, the Republican majority. Here you're, you're citing the bill that would make it much more difficult for citizens to mount initiatives. And then we have the dark money scandal of householder and just the misuse of big money anyway in politics. But my question to you as the executive director of Common Cause is how do we build a grassroots base that really is knowledgeable about, angry about, and informed about that will really work on the legislature. When I was chair of Common Cause Ohio, I know I made a couple of testimony trips to Columbus to make uh, testimony before committees. They were shocked to see a citizen there. You know, they're used to lobbies and various groups like that, but they're not used to citizens having an interest and a knowledge about what's going on in Columbus. And so what I am really concerned about is how do we fire up people to really get involved. Well, he, he asks a very easy question, naturally. Uh, so, so this is what I would, would tell you. So yesterday, um, we organized folks to come to the State House for the hearing of House Joint Resolution 1. So you saw that picture of all the folks that were behind um, Brian Stewart as he was testifying. There were 150 folks who came to the State House 
you know, many of them a little bit closer to Columbus, you know, than Cincinnati, but there were folks that traveled from Toledo. There were, there were folks that traveled from all over to be there. And the reason that folks showed up to be there was because essentially the chair of the committee, this is the Constitutional Revision Committee, his name is Scott Wiggum. He established rules that said that we can't testify, that only people who were invited to testify are permitted to testify. And they are making all of these changes to make it harder and harder to influence the process. And I think people are more and more aware of just all of the kind of games that are going on. Um, yes, you know, certainly it is a real uphill battle, but I have to tell you when I was, you know, and they call it the crypt, when I'm in the basement of the, the state, the state house yesterday with 150 people, well, there's not room for them in the hearing room and they have to do an overflow room and there's still not enough room for all of us that there are folks that are starting to really pay attention and there, and that, at the end of the day, you know, this this uh, effort, this House Joint Resolution 1 effort, they see the political power of people. They see the power of collecting signatures and citizen-led ballot measures, and they're doing everything they can to stop them. Now, it, they're focused especially on the reproductive rights. You know, th these are, you know, folks who are often very pro-life, you know, just to use their pro-life. Um, I think the thing that's very important here is they are maliciously using the system that we have had in place for more than a hundred years to make it harder for us to put a check on their power. And yes, um, I assume, uh, you know, I, I assume that they will successfully get this on the ballot. Now, you'll remember, you know, we stopped this kind of effort, this attack on direct democracy in 2018. Um, we stopped this effort in December, you know, when they were having discussions with lame duck. There were, you know, hundreds of people, 140 different organizations, hundred, I, you know, I, I have no sense of how many flooded, flooded the state house during the lame duck session, December 13th. I can send you all sorts of wonderful pictures if you want. Um, you know, came and and essentially we stopped this attack in December. Um, I think we got lucky stopping it so it wouldn't be on the May primary because the the there was a speaker fight, and because of the speaker fight, they you know it's like they were not getting their act together. the The problem is, you know, we you know if you think about it, we we push back beginning, you know essentially more than five years ago. So, so that we should be thinking about, you know, yes, we held off for a while. Now we're going to actually have to do a campaign. Um, I don't know how many people who are there live have a clipboard with them. Yes, one. <laughs> okay, so this is what I'm saying. Right now, there are people out there with clipboards. This is an opportunity for people with clipboards, not just to talk about kind of, you know, reproductive rights or not just to talk about kind of bodily autonomy and all of the kinds of things that you might talk about as you were collecting signatures, but also to talk about, this is incredibly important. The ability to have a check on the state legislature, the ability to address gerrymandering or the manipulation of district lines and the manipulation of elections, which leads to the manipulation of public policy. There are lots of different ways to talk about this, but being super clear that this is a tool for citizens to use is incredibly important. I have not gone out of the house in the past few days where I haven't run into run into somebody with a clipboard. I'm not talking about my own clipboard. I'm talking about I run into people. I went off and I had coffee today um, and there was somebody collecting signatures. And so what I was gonna say is, you know, as um, signature collection ramps up, as we have more conversations about how important this right that voters have, and, and the thing to remember about 1912, you know, is that, the person who advocated for this, uh, there were two primary ones. 
One was William Jennings Bryan. I don't think anybody's surprised by that. The other was Teddy Roosevelt. And, and the reason that we have the citizen initiative, well, the reason that we have direct democracy is because corporations um, were really taking advantage. Imagine the Gilded Age and ima- you know, imagine the kind of, you know, how omnipresent corporations were and how folks were really abused. That, to, that ability to do direct democracy was a tool to check corruption at the legislature and to address corporate greed. And we need it now more than ever, and we should do what we can to protect it. And so, you know, I think this is like anything. We need to have conversations with one another to get people thinking about how important this is. And then, of course, we're going to have to get out the vote when it comes to July. um, We're going to, you know, we're going to have to get people prepared so that they actually get to the polls for that August special election, because that's the biggest issue, right? The biggest issue is people will care about it. but it's an election in August, and most of us don't even really think about elections being in August. Catherine, can you can you elaborate a little bit on the reproductive rights uh, connection here? Okay, so so there are folks that are out there collecting signatures to put a measure before the voters in November of 2023. Um, so I you know I don't have a ton of information. It's not a campaign I'm working on, but what what I can say is this would enable you know, do- doctors to provide healthcare that was necessary when it comes to miscarriages, for example. It would also provide, it provides kind of specific information about kind of bodily autonomy and you know, women's bodily autonomy when it comes to reproductive uh, freedoms. Uh, so, so if it's on the November ballot, right? It should only have to pass by 50%, right? Because that's the rules right now. Right. But if they change the rules in August of 23, then it, we, it could be that it'll be 60%. And, and you know what? 60% is a big threshold. Uh, 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 for example, um, abortion rights, um, our neighbor, Michigan, um, did it just last year. Um, they, I think they hit 57%. So clearly a, a significant majority but it is incredibly challenging to get to 60%. That's, that is actually a really large hurdle. And the other way to think about this is 40%. If, if you can hit 59% and not have enough, well, that means that you know a minority, 41%, has more rights than the majority. And so we, we do need to think about, well, how will this affect the specific issue? And how will it affect redistricting. You know, we know we could get to 60%, but even that could be really hard. And certainly not having kind of the additional days in case there's a problem with signatures is really problematic. And it will put folks off who might say, hey, I'd like to do a ballot measure. It could put them off. And you can think about, you know, if you're somebody who cares about ranked choice voting or you know, qualified immunity and all of the different kinds of things, you know, if, if you and I decided we wanted to do one about dark money, and sometimes that's the only way you can rein things in in states, we might be like 60% and there's no kind of possibility of if we don't get enough signatures, that is really problematic. Um, and, and, and so, so yes, we can think about it in terms of short-term implications, but we should also also think about it kind of in long term. What does this mean, you know, for the Ohioans of 2030? What does it mean for the Ohioans of 2040? It dilutes their political power. There's another part to that too. I think that re- that new law that they're trying to pass would also require the petitions to be done in all 88 counties rather than just the 44 now. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's that's overwhelming, right? So this is the other thing. Okay, let's suppose in the current rules, right? Just the current rules. Y'all, you know, there are enough signatures with the current rules and the, the filing is in July, right? Well, if the rules change midstream, Yes, there can be legal battles over it, but 
but um, it could be that they'll say, well, wait a second, they didn't get 5% in 88 counties, which they were supposed to do when they filed, let's say July 2nd, they should have done that any, you know. So, it, I mean, it just throws a monkey wrench in the whole thing. And I think one of the things to think about is, you know, it's very unusual. It's very unusual to have kind of um, an attack during the signature gathering phase. And this is an attack during the signature gathering phase that doesn't just affect this campaign, but it, it is really problematic for, uh, you know, our reproductive rights friends. And I'm so sorry, I actually, I'm, I'm actually doing a thing at one um, Tiffany, are you willing to throw my um, my email into the chat? And then um, I what I'll do is I'll share this, you know, we'll share the slides with Bill so that if you are interested in the slides, I'll share the slides. Now, I don't, even though I shared a ton of incredibly depressing information, we should feel empowered. Like we can, we can win. We can win a no campaign in August. We can kick their butts and we should. And so as we think about going forward, um, it's gonna be an incredibly big fight, um, but I think we're up for it. And this is an opportunity to engage more people and get them thinking more broadly about what's happening at the state house. And I, I, I did want to thank you all for doing this via Zoom rather than my traveling down to you. I appreciate the opportunity today to talk to you all. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Catherine. Very thank much. You, Catherine.